but a, in some sort of reasonable way. I'm going to start <coughs> with the economy, and I'm going to start in the United States for obvious reasons. That particular quote happens to be Bernie Sanders, so therefore it will obviously be massively divided in respect of perceptions anywhere in the United States today, but it doesn't really matter because it reflects a dimension of the tension, of the divide, that we're actually grappling with in economic terms around the world today. Why are we not growing? Why are jobs, to take Jim Clifton's reference to the coming jobs war and the preeminent importance of jobs in respect of the future, the difficulties of how to have any sense of human worth or human dignity in the absence of any economic opportunity that John speaks so much about, that key problem is a near universal problem. You can make the proposition with absolute accuracy that productivity increases have been disaggregated from employment opportunity. So even when we are striving to increase productivity on a continuing basis, that doesn't mean we're creating more jobs. In fact, in many cases, we're shedding jobs in order to improve financial and economic <coughs> productivity and profitability in many different areas. So, where are we today? Well, the latest reports out of the United States actually look very good. We've got unemployment measured the way it's measured, down to 5.6%. We added 252,000 jobs in December. And broadly speaking, the United States appears to be on track in terms of GDP growth measures back onto a sustainable path. Not quite for a whole variety of different reasons, but nonetheless, broadly speaking, that appears to be true. If you <clears throat> take Brookings' assessment of that, you'll see that even Brookings, which is probably one of the most critical institutions in the United States today in respect of what is happening on employment versus growth, is saying that impressive job gains cap a year of steady labor market improvement. But, if you go and take a Nobel Prize winner who chaired the Global Commission on High Growth Economies, Mike Spence, he's actually just produced an article which is in Project Syndicate, headed Five Reasons for Slow Growth, and I'm actually going to go into those in just a moment because I agree with at least four of them. So, we've got what Larry Summers likes to call secular stagnation in a large portion of the global economy at the moment, certainly in a very large portion of the advanced economies. The only exception to that at present being the United States. And there are elements of weakness in U.S. growth under present circumstances that do not make it clear that the U.S. will be able to pull the rest through the sludge in which they're trapped at present. I'm going to show you some figures that include not only assessments of the present, but projections into the future. Please don't believe them. The simple reality is that there is no consistency. I'll show you very briefly both OECD and IMF figures. The World Bank published different figures yesterday. The IMF and the OECD figures differ from one another and almost every macroeconomic model that we are using anywhere in the world today of some sophistication is producing slightly different results. The simple truth is we don't know. What's more frightening, and as you'll see, Spence makes this remark in his article, is that the IMF has been obliged to adjust downwards every single quarter over the last four years its growth projections. So, not only don't we know at any particular fixed point, the only thing that we do know is that recent performance suggests that the figures that we're putting out are probably too high. That's very scary for a whole variety of reasons. The bottom line is, we got to where we got to today through unconventional monetary policies. Not only cheap money, preeminently from the Fed, but also the Bank of Japan, but in addition to that, by quantitative easing and the purchase 
of mortgage securities and government bonds. As a consequence of that, the impact on balance sheets of the financial institutions that we regard as the guarantors of the economic system, central banks around the world, has been totally extraordinary. They all have between three and four times the balance sheets today that they had in 2009. And it is not clear to anyone what will happen when that exceedingly loose money is in fact withdrawn as normalization, not tightening, of monetary policy actually comes into play. We focused on redefining the banking system in a variety of different ways. Capital adequacy and liquidity have become major issues. But perfectly honestly, it's really frightening how little we have succeeded in doing. And I don't mean that we haven't done an enormous amount, but relative to requirement, we've done in school really little. Let me give you a simple example. The requirements for US registered banks are quite different to UK registered banks, are quite different to continental European banks, are quite different to Swiss banks. But all of these banks happen to be global banks. So therefore, you have an extraordinary amount of regulatory arbitrage taking place in respect to these particular jurisdictions. And in addition to this, you have a significant amount of growth in respect to the shadow banks. Anyone who pretends that we've got a grip on systemic financial risk is either smoking something or lying through his or her teeth. We have no grip on systemic financial risk whatever because we don't know how to measure it. We don't have the records of the flows until at least three months after the event. We cannot calculate the nature of the opaque instruments that are still characteristic in respect of the interbank lending market. We have no idea about the net effects of trade-offs between CDOs, CDSs, other related derivative instruments at any point in time. Therefore, there is a lot of experimental work taking place in this area, but most of what is described as macroprudential policy in the financial sector is actually microprudential policy at scale. And microprudential policy, in other words, looking at how an individual bank's balance sheet actually looks and whether it has adequate capital and is sufficiently liquid is very interesting and very important, but it doesn't tell us anything about the work of the system. So, against all of those particular backdrops, the simple truth is that we have a huge household debt overhang. We have got global macroeconomic imbalances much better than they were in 2009, but as we eliminate the cheap money, that has driven the recovery up to this particular point in time, we have to be perfectly blunt with you, absolutely no idea what is going to happen to the global imbalances either. What we do know is the Chinese are now sitting on $4 trillion of foreign exchange reserves, and it's $4 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. And one of the things that is happening in this regard is that they are starting to create new institutions, the so-called New Development Bank, was created at Fortaleza in Brazil at the meeting of the BRICS. It's the first of these particular institutions which intend consciously to circumvent the Bretton Woods Institution, to circumvent the IMF and the World Bank, and to create mechanisms to achieve two purposes. One, to allow for a development model that the Chinese perceive to be more effective than the current Western model, and two, to allow them to earn a higher rate of return on their foreign exchange reserves than they can in respect to treasury notes and bills. And if you bear in mind that the return on T-bills under present circumstances and 10-year notes under present circumstances is actually negative uh, in real terms, it's perfectly obvious why somebody sitting on full trillion would actually want to try and get a better rate of return. So, what have we got? I'm not going to go through the detail here. The bottom line in respect to it is the advanced economies are sluggish apart from the United States. The European Union, and particularly the Eurozone, is not really going to go anywhere. Japan has actually slid off its 2013 high, retreated significantly in 2014, and there's very little chance of recovery in 2015. At the same time, their debt to GDP ratios have risen dramatically. Trade is going to pick up moderately. Fiscal tightening will continue in most of the developed economies, probably outside of the United States, but the 
pace will slow, and the dominant trade in forex markets is going to be a strong US dollar. The developed economies are not going to do anything in terms of contributing to overall global growth, despite the fact that the US economy is improving appreciably. In the developing countries, you're seeing a very wide divergence occurring in respect to growth rates. Forget BRICS. Forget BRICS. Don't even think about the concept of BRICS any longer. It's an institutional phenomenon because it has been institutionalized. And it was, of course, originally, idea, originally an idea of Jim O'Neill's at uh, Goldman Sachs, but the bottom line about it is that what is happening in Russia and Brazil has nothing to do with what is happening in China. And what is happening in China is significantly greater than anything that's going to happen in India, and South Africa is marginal in respect of the whole. So the BRICS are integrated entity as an analytical tool are essentially meaningless. We're seeing significant divergence. Africa's momentum will continue. The estimates at the moment suggest very close to 5% aggregate growth in 2015-16. East Asia will continue to be the fastest growing, stable growth of about 6.1% and 6% over the same period. South Asia more slowly, Latin America and the Caribbean very moderately, and in CIS as a whole, extremely weak. The euro area is frankly utterly precarious under present circumstances. A Greek exit, a Grexit, is being signaled by Berlin to be perfectly tolerable under present circumstances. Some of this is bluster ahead of the Greek elections, but it's entirely unclear what the outcome of that will be. The simple reality is the debt to GDP ratios in most of the advanced economies, certainly in all of the continental economies, are at unprecedentedly high levels. In Germany, the reason for the level is because of bailout provisions in respect of the Mediterranean countries. In most of the rest of the Eurozone in Europe, it is as a result of weak structural performance, inadequate demand growth, and over -investments. It is not going to be easy to come out of that without an enormous surge in monetary easing, which Draghi of the European Central Bank is looking at at the present, but against the opposition of Germany and potentially against the German, German Constitutional Court declaring it unconstitutional for the European Central Bank to engage in such activities. So, if you were looking into a, a dream world, he would say the solution to all of this is more extensive, deeper, more fundamental international monetary collaboration with a degree of fiscal coordination so that we can manage what is fundamentally a global economy in a more efficient and integrated way. And if you think that's going to happen, then ask yourself how much of it's going to be happening in Washington, never mind in the world at large, in the course of the next 12 months. The problem is brutally put. We have created an integrated global economy in a world where there is almost no sense of community and in the absence of an overarching quality to manage the economy. Now that's the truth. One can dress it up in different ways. We obviously have to deal with the reality that we confront, and we will. We've been doing so even through the last five years, and we'll continue to do that. But that's the underlying problem that we face. Those are the figures, if you want to get a sense of it, in terms of the world at large. What really matters in terms of all of this is just to understand that this remarkable curve up here, which happens to be China, has been the reason for an enormous amount of why we've got through this particular recession. If Chinese growth had not been where it was, if China were not at the point where it is now the second largest economy of, of, in the world at roughly $10 trillion, growing still, we think, this year at about 7.1% per annum, and if there hadn't been massive monetary easing out of the Fed and the Bank of Japan, frankly, we would have plowed into the ground. 
we have pulled the plane back. We are no longer on a precipitous descent. We're now sort of pulling out of this dive in a very awkward way, but it's fundamentally dependent on China not having a hard landing and a shift towards a more accommodative economic and so monetary policy taking place in the Eurozone. If either one of those two goes wrong, the United States economy is not powerful enough to pull the world through this particular period. That's just a picture on the left, don't worry about the detail, but that shows you what has happened since 2008 up to the end of 2013 when tapering started in respect to the Fed in terms of the Fed's balance sheet. If you have a look at the Bank of Japan's balance sheet, it looks roughly the same. As I say, every advanced economy has something similar, albeit on a smaller scale. And the simple reality about all of this is that the emerging markets, which have been the thing that has pulled us through the last five years, are most directly hit by the tightening of monetary policy, the normalization of monetary policy. Why? Because completely disproportionate amounts of flows of portfolio capital went to the emerging markets between 2009 and 2013 roughly $1.1 trillion, which is about $470 billion over the long-term structural trade. There is now a flight to safety back to the dollar. There is even some flight to safety in respect of gold. And so as a consequence of that, there, are depressed, there is depressed stock market performance across the emerging markets. We don't know what happens if interest rates start to rise appreciably in either Britain or the United States in the course of 2015, 2016. But it will certainly depress smaller emerging market performance in terms of the portfolio flows. So, again, the last point is this dream idea. Christine Lagarde said it rather elegantly at Jackson Hole. She's in Director, the managing director of the IMF, for those of you who haven't registered it immediately. But uh, Christine, having been a synchronized swimmer in her youth, chose to suggest that the synchronization of monetary policy worldwide was perhaps the only solution in respect of addressing these particular challenges going forward. My reaction, and I'm sure those of most other people listening to her at the time, was a good idea, Christine, but it ain't going to happen. And I fear that's the truth of where we are under present circumstances. Now, I'm showing you this in order to enable you to read it later, not to talk about it now. But the bottom line is that slow growth is a function of ineffective use of fiscal capacity in those countries that have fiscal capacity. One of the questions that one ought to ask in the United States today is why would the fairly ghastly state of physical infrastructure. Why aren't you investing more in upgrading physical infrastructure? If one thinks about these things in practical terms, efficiencies are driven largely by three things. They're driven by the quality of physical infrastructure, water power, transport, and ICT. They're driven by the quality of the human capital that you have, and by the quality of the institution. We all know you shouldn't borrow to spend on consumption. We all know that it makes sense to borrow for the purpose of investment. So from a practical perspective, today, rather than maintaining current levels of entitlements, why are we not seeing a significant shift of overall fiscal expenditure into infrastructure? Europe's starting to sort of wobble in that direction at much too slow a rate. And Spencer's second point is that even if Europe does that, it will not be as effective as it is if the United States were to do it. Because there is more structural flexibility in the US economy than there is in the great majority of European institutions. So as a consequence, the multipliers available in terms of a shift to capital investment spending in the United States are actually much higher than they will be even if it starts to occur in the European space. But 
The third one is one that ought to concern everyone around this table today. There is a huge disaggregation. It's occurred most markedly in the last 10 years, but it's been happening for the last 30. A huge disaggregation between the financial markets and the real economy. The performance in the financial markets increasingly bear no intrinsic relationship whatever to the performance of the real economy. And the reason for that, and I'll speak to it a little bit more in a moment, is that we are seeing increasing returns to scale in capital investment and declining returns to scale in respect of labor. That's not going to change. But it raises the question about how stimulus to the financial markets, in this particular case, loose monetary policy that enables additional investment opportunity, translates into real economic benefit. And it's not clear what those relationships are today. What we can see is that disparities are rising. Disparities have risen highly significantly in the United States and in Britain. But quite frankly, they've risen across the entirety of continental Europe as well, including in Scandinavia. So it's a structural secular not an issue that is only driven by policy. And that's got huge implications for the way in which we think about these things going forward. The last point that really matters is that we've got to recognize that Markets don't solve problems for everybody. Markets solve problems for most people sitting around this day. Why? Because we understand how they work. So you can make reasonably intelligent bets if you really understand how the system works. But if you don't, if you're simply a taker of whatever happens, then by definition you're caught with it on the short end of the stick all the time. And as the majority of populations in most countries in the world today do not understand how the system work and certain works and certainly don't understand how markets work. That's why financial literacy and related <coughs> programs are so critically important. Then one, these disparities will continue. And two, the level of social dissatisfaction that we're seeing rising in most parts of the world today will become an increasing social and political. So, if that's the case, then try, let's try and look forward. What can we say? The first thing is that there are certain geoeconomic phenomena which are shaping developments going forward. I'm going to do it in cliché terms, forgive me for not doing it in more depth, the time doesn't allow, but the centre of economic gravity, having shifted from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic in the late 18th and 19th centuries, is now shifting to the Pacific. And to the Pacific. Now, there is nothing, nothing that one can see in secular terms that is going to disrupt that trend. That doesn't mean the United States is going to become irrelevant anytime soon. You've got a huge Pacific coast apart from anything else. It's one of the reasons why in Latin America the Pacific Alliance has significantly outstripped the performance of Mercosur. The underlying reality is that most economic activity in the world today is happening around the littoral of the Pacific, which makes the Trans-Pacific Partnership an enormously important objective in respect of the United States and other countries today. But this is a first fundamental issue. Related to that, however, we have certain core problems. One, we have a crisis-prone global economy with a significant degree of fiscal stress, and tapering of unconventional monetary policies, which has powered us out of the present situation. The restructuring of the financial sector is creating huge degrees of uncertainty. There is one instrument, by the way, which those of you who are bankers will know a lot about, and that's Basel III, which does, in principle, apply on a global scale. But the implications of Basel III are quite terrifying when you apply them globally. The role of the banking sector historically in the United States in terms of asset structuring and in respect of corporate finance is a tiny fraction of the role of the banking sector in Europe in the same areas. As a consequence of that, European banks have on their balance sheets 
something equivalent to three times the European economy. U.S. banks have on their balance sheet something equivalent to one time the U.S. economy. So the implications of the same capital asset ratio for European and U.S. banks are quite different. So even Basel III, which in some way corrects for the problem of regulatory arbitrage, is going to have disruptive effects, at least in Europe in respect to its application. We then, related to that, have no adequate means of addressing these issues in terms of global governance terms, and we have these problems of socio-economic inequality that I've described. Geopolitical tensions, you're probably generally well aware of, China, Japan, and the Koreas, tensions in terms of the South Asian Sea as well, Russia, Ukraine, USA, and India trying to figure out what it's going to do in the midst of the whole of that space. We have crisis across Middle East and North Africa, and no immediate instruments available to us to be able to address them satisfactorily. And we have huge disruptions currently being engendered in respect of employment and education by both linear and disruptive technological change. And this is occurring right across the whole technology spectrum. It's occurring in infotech, it's occurring in biotech, it's occurring in nanotech, and it's occurring in cognitech. Direct machine-to-brain interfaces, brain-to-brain -brain interfaces, a whole series of quite extraordinary things that are going to fundamentally transform the way in which we operate in all of these spaces. And if that weren't enough, we also have a significant amount of strains in what I'm going to call the biogeosphere, because we have gone in the last roughly 190 years, I beg your pardon, the last 90 years, we have gone from 2 billion people to 7.2 billion people, heading for 9.5 billion. By when? 9.5 million by when? By 2050. So as a consequence of that, plus the fact that we're all consuming significantly more than we did before, Think about how each one of you consumes relative to your parents. And as a result of the fact that more and more people are urbanizing and hence gaining access to urban services, that pattern of production, consumption, and waste is increasing at an exponential scale, not only because of the increase in numbers, but because of the increase in consumption, manufacturing, and waste disposal at the same time. Now this is pushing up, hold it to the end if you don't mind. This is pushing up against what you can think of as planetary bound. We don't know enough about how the system works. We don't have good models of the biogeosphere. We don't know what the impacts are going to be. The only thing that we can be sure about is that it's going to pose a whole series of additional challenges. If you push this out, over the sort of time horizon that I believe Operation Hope needs to be thinking about today, then you want to be thinking about how this might look out to 2030. The first thing is that the geoeconomic trends are going to continue. There will be inflection points. There may be a Chinese hard landing. Financial intermediation in China may pose insurmountable problems at a certain point in time. They may not be able to shift fast enough from an investment and export-led economy to a consumption-based economy. They may have social tensions if they drop below 6.4 or 6.5%. There's all sorts of things that could upset the Chinese growth cycle. But that secular shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific is not likely to change over the horizon that I'm describing. The second point that seems near certain is that we're going to see higher and rising returns to capital and falling returns to labor. That means, in simple terms, rising inequality and increased social tensions. That is the mission of everyone sitting around this table. That is the mission of Operation Hope, to find ways of overcoming. Sean, you rewind that tape just a little bit, because that last thing, right before you said, uh, give me the last three minutes again. If you have access to cheap capital, you can make money. If you can't get into a bank 
You can't do anything except go back. So if you are an investor with access to low-cost capital, you will continue to be able to outperform the median performance. If you do not have access to banking systems, you will necessarily degrade your financial status. But, but it's now secular. It's not, it's not just something that we can say generically. It's actually baked into the system under present circumstances. If we don't crack that, that is what this forum is supposed to be about, making capitalism more inclusive. If we do not find ways of doing that, we can't solve for any of the other problems. We're still going to have lots of problems that we can find ways of doing that. But we cannot solve for any of them if we don't do that. This problem, the second one, the one we've just been talking about, I think is going to be exaggerated, it's going to be exacerbated by the breakthroughs that we are seeing in info, bio, nano, and cognotech at this point in time. Because only well-educated, smart people with entrepreneurial minds are going to be able to capitalize on those opportunities. And if you are a 51-year-old blue-collar worker in Detroit, or if you are a mid-level white-collar worker performing routine functions in an audit firm, an accounting firm, a bank, or a law firm, you're toast. Because the simple reality is that with big data and better computing capability, machines will be able to do it much better than you. So we're not only at a position where we can see it today, it's a trend moving forward. And one of the things that's happening as a consequence of this is we're seeing a sharp decline in trusting governments, trusting large institutions, general satisfaction with democratic politics, participation in voting. The midterms saw the lowest voter turnout since the middle of the Second World War in the United States. Uh, the same pattern is apparent right across Western Europe on the present surface. Japan is no better. And a significant part of this is that an enormously large number of people are feeling increasingly excluded from the system. They think it's gained against them, or they don't know how to influence it, and they've come to the conclusion that voting sure as hell doesn't make any difference. And on the back end of all of that, you'll therefore see a reversion in some areas to more local and in some cases more primitive identities. And by primitive identities I mean clan, tribe, religion, local bands. One of the great achievements of the 20th century was the creation of scale in terms of identity. The emergence of the state as an encompassing way of absorbing identity and tolerating difference but reconciling in the great majority of cases. Aren't you seeing that right now? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. It's just that it's a trend that's going to continue. Because the underlying reality of what we have at present is that it is structurally near inevitable that this will continue because we can't solve for the social inclusiveness problem as long as you have continuing higher returns to capital and declining returns to labor. And I will add to that, higher returns to technology ownership. So, question. I don't want to get you off. No. By the way, everybody, I tell you it's brilliant. Is, is that that? So, so, oh my God. So, no, no, we don't. So, I don't want to stop right so, so, I don't get you off track, but I, I was watching the documentary the other day, and it said that the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, started as a club after the Civil War, and they were just trying to scare blacks initially. They were having fun, putting um, robes on and act like they were ghosts. And they're scaring free blacks, they're having fun. They realized the fear was working, and sort of amped up. Yep. Then during Reconstruction, it amped up again, yep. because people were fearful, whites were fearful yep. of what this quote meant to them. And 
Governments want to say, that's not good for the country or whatever, they squashed it. It went underground until the Great Depression. It popped its head up again during the Great Depression. Times of fear, and, uh, and then it went underground again. And it, I think it had strength at 4 million members. That, and it was a big rally in D.C. with 4 million members, I think it was in 1924. Then it popped up again. Um, with a guy named Bob somebody, in 1964, um, when he sort of rallied everybody together. And the thing was, we're not as good as professional whites, but we're better than you. That was essentially the, the social scientist said that the, the white Klansman's view was they had to be better than somebody. And while they would accept they were not as good as their white successful brothers, they damn well going to be better than blah, blah, blah. I know. I've actually seen that article, but your metaphor is right. Okay. Um, the, the underlying reality is in times of stress, in times of fear, people revert to more primitive identities. They want to be stronger, better than someone. Right? It's not, it's not a question of whether you're aspiring to the top. You don't aspire to the top in conditions of stress. You just try and hang in there. You try and show strength. You rely on the people closest to you. You form secret societies. You identify in clan groups. You do all of these types of things. The whole of history is repeated. The difficulty of what we're seeing in a whole lot of different parts of the world today, it's not just the IS, Islamic State, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh, uh, Al Qaeda related issues. It's not something characteristic of Islam, although it is exacerbated in the Islamic spaces. It is present throughout almost the entirety of society. Look at what, what is happening in France, in, Ger in Germany, in Denmark, in Britain, in respect of opposition to the European Union. Look at the rise of parties that are narrow and sectarian and seeking to exclude enemies. All of this is a function of high levels of social stress, which then tends to produce a reliance on narrow perspectives. <clears throat> the Tea Party, with great respect, was a similar phenomenon. The difficulty about all of this is that unless you fix for the circumstances that are causing it, it will continue to happen. That's the underlying problem. You can't fix party. You've got to fix it systemically. And then, without wishing to go into this on a large scale, all of this pushes for migratory flows, and all of this pushes for additional social tensions because societies in conditions of stress are not ready to be able to handle large scale flows of the other into their own stress. Now, if you have a quick look at this, and I'm going to do this extraordinarily fast, here are the secular trends. There's nothing in respect to the projections that suggests that the advanced economies will recover their position. The shifting geoeconomics suggests at the moment, this is the Chatham House study of last year, that the US in 2000 had roughly 31% of the global economy, that that will fall to about 21% by 2018, that China had about 3.7% of the global economy in 2000, rising to about 15.3%. It gives you some sense of the general trend. The detail is obviously wrong, simply because projections about the future are always wrong. If you project this out on the basis of OECD figures to 2030, then you can see China going from 17% to 28% over the same period, and you can see the United States in grey shrinking as from 23% to 18%. So that secular trend, I think, is pretty well established. But the really important thing to understand about it is that there's nothing odd. This is actually the way history has been. This is Western Europe. There's its peak. There's its decline. This is the United States. There's its peak. There's its decline. These are all relative. It doesn't mean that the US has got weaker. It means that it has a lower share of the global economy. Sean, what year, I can't say, but what year is Europe's peak up there? Let, 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 me, let me show you, just by moving to the next slide, Jim. That is when India peaked. What year is that? 
That is 1700. That is when China peaked. That's 1820. That is when Europe peaked. It's about 1897. What do you call Europe? The five H stage? Yeah, it, it's the way Europe was configured before the First World War. So you, you, you've got to think of it as post Bismarck, but before uh, the dismantlement of. of uh, there is the peak of the U.S. over that particular period. If you look at it slightly differently, this is as a percentage of global economy. Don't, don't, don't get too carried away about what it means. It doesn't mean the U.S. has been in decline since then. The U.S. has grown from that point from about $4 trillion to about $15.7 trillion today. It's been a massive increase in aggregate terms in respect to the U.S. economy. Can you just read out what the year of the U.S. is the peak? It's around about 1952. Now, the reason why the U.S. was as high in that intervening period is precisely because of Europe's relative decline and the United States' sharp rise in the immediate aftermath of World War I. The United States had 50% of the global economy at the end of World War II. Right? Nobody else was in the running. Everything else was devastating. So it was quite inevitable if you enabled reconstruction in Germany and Japan, and as a consequence, Europe got off the ground. It was quite inevitable that there would be a significant improvement of the others, and that your own share would necessarily decline over that period. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that in secular terms, the simple reality is that the US was not there for most of its history. Western Europe was not there for most of its history. In fact, if you go far enough back, it was precisely India and China that were the dominant powers in the global economy. So in one way, we're seeing a reversion to a mean. In one way. You mustn't get hung up about the last hundred years of history and imagine that that is human history. The critical issue is not that. The critical issue is, are we growing in a way that is consistent with planetary boundaries, so we're not going to end up with an ecological disaster, and in a way that is consistent with a sense of social equity, so we don't end up with massive, large-scale social and political dissent. That's the challenge. But we're not really thinking about it. And because we're not really thinking about it in that way, we're not solving it. So our present path doesn't make sense. Ironically, the people in this room are all involved with an endeavor that makes vastly more sense than what the vast majority of people outside of this room are involved with on the present step. But we've got to solve for that problem. If we don't solve for it, we're in deep trouble. Now, around this, this secular growth is doing remarkable things. These are the new large cities in the world. And you may notice there aren't all that many in the United States and in Western Europe. They're mostly out on the Pacific. A significant number happening in Africa and in Latin America. But it's mostly Asia in which it's happening. And if you want to see what's happening in China... Just go there. <laughs> that sounds utterly remarkable. Quite extraordinary. The number of cities of more than 10 million people in China today has passed the 100 mark. Wow. Huh? <laughs> I don't think most of it's sustainable. I think half of them are probably going to be ghost stuff. Because a significant amount of it has been driven by high investment in capital infrastructure and not necessarily by long term demand factors. But however that may be, that's where it's happening under present circumstances. And what's going to slow it in China, but it's going to slow it in Europe faster, Japan faster, and in the US to a certain degree as well, is aging. Because the underlying problem is that as we have better access to health services, and as we have better support services, we're all living longer. Which means that you're seeing a significant shift away from the vast majority of population being of working age to an increasing percentage of population in much of the world being in retirement. Should be. The wall China's problem, Sean. I mean, isn't that one? Yeah. Just 
probably. I mean, the, you know, we were supposed to have, when I was a kid, I think we had seven workers to one retiree. Now it's, now it's down to under three. If China beats us to the wall. Well, China beats us to the wall for two reasons, but chiefly because of the one child policy. As a, as a result of their one child policy, and the fact that the vast majority of those people were in fact men, right? Because there was a higher premium seen to be associated with male children than female children during that particular period. Uh, you can see the pace over here at which they in fact get into, into that decline. It's an excessively high, it's a very sharp peak in decline. But it's sort of unfixable. Well, it's probably unfixable because they don't have the institutions. In other words, there is no social security, there is no health insurance, there is none of these sort of things available in the Chinese space. So one of the things that may pull back Chinese growth significantly is the fact that there's this very large propensity to save because you've got no social institutions. So if, you're, if you can't rely on a pension, if you can't rely on a health service system, then you've got to make provision for yourself and therefore it's baked into the Chinese tradition from the time of Lao Tzu and, and Confucius. They're trying to shift that, because if you want to shift from being an investment-led, export-led, to consumption-led economy, which is their plan for 2030, you have to encourage people to consume and hence save less. But if you haven't got the adequate institutions in place, it's impossible to do that. But, but I don't want to get you off the China thing, but let me, let me I, I go there from time of year, as you know, <coughs> have very strong views. Let me just ask you this question. I'll make a statement that uh, ask you a question about whether I'm, 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 Wrong, 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 wrong. All right. I'm going to build a bit on what Jim said. Um, I see enormous ghost cities when I go there right now. Sure. Um, the local governments don't even report their municipal debt to the federal government last time I checked. Um, well, they're only reported when they want coverage. <laughs> so there's, there's always a significant lag. The so, debt gets very big before it gets reported. Yeah. So, but the larger issue is I was giving a speech there in 2000. Nine, you have to get the global crisis. People were laughing at me because of America. I go off to the side, same guy laughing at me, he comes up to me and says, you know, we're jealous of America. I said, I don't understand. You guys are supposed to kick it we're in, now we're getting our ready to kick it. He said, because you've got this soaring rhetoric, this constitution, Bill of Rights, Judeo-Christian values, this, this social contract. Um, we, we just have money. And we feel that when we run out of money, uh, or the opportunity to tell somebody who makes the money, and we don't have more than 6% growth, then we don't have some growth problems here in the form of, of serious social unrest and very unhappy people. We don't have other things to rely on. Freedoms, da, 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 da. Let's take the totality of that, okay? because it, 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 otherwise the point gets made like infinity or without getting any swearing away. But the, the, the issue is quite simple. They have 5,500 years of history. The fact that for roughly, roughly 5,000 years of that, they were one of the top three powers in the world tells you they have actually got some pretty significant heritage, which means significant heritage, which means they've got ways of solving problems. Okay. Anyone who doesn't recognize that the combination of Tao, Taoism, and Confucianism is a monumentally efficient normative system doesn't understand China. But that isn't how they've grown over the last 15 to 20 years. They've grown over the last 15 to 20 years by taking the worst attributes of robber capitalism and basically squeezing the normative stuff into the back space. And because the Communist Party of China wished to retain control over this period, it was very happy to utilize those instruments as a mechanism for going forward. So one part of what he was saying is absolutely right, the other part of what he was saying is not right. If they actually relied on their own normative principles, they could be the great power that they were until the end of the Middle East. But that isn't how they've grown over the last 20 years. The only person that I know under the age of 25 who has 32 luxury cars, I'm talking about stuff that costs anything over half a, million, a half a million dollars each, happens to be a 23-year-old in Shanghai. Right. So excessive consumption has become the mark of dignity among the principles in the Chinese space. And if anything is going to blow them apart from the age of issue, it's going to be that. Now that is what Xi is trying to crack down on at this moment. That's what the corruption drive is all about. 
It's trying to get back to a better grip on the national finances so that the plan for 2030 can actually be put into place and not be siphoned off by the principles on a significant scale. Will they succeed? I don't know. But the only thing that I would say is please don't pray for them to lose their growth path. Because if, the, if China loses its growth path, if it sinks below 6%, you are in deep trouble. You think we're <coughs> I sincerely hope not to, but I think that there is a 30% chance that it will keep. In, in the fine, in the fine, now I know, well, I think I know what you're about to say, but go ahead. The fine, like the military, I keep telling them, the military is not for us, it's for them. But they want you to define for us what deep trouble looks like. If it, if trouble well, the, the, the first thing about it is that if you are not in a position to be able to access their four trillion in foreign exchange reserves, you can't maintain the flexibility of fiscal policy associated with your having quite a bit of defense balance sheet over the course of the past few four years. We are utterly, utterly joined at the hip in respect of the, of the monetary space in the world under present circumstances. If they stop buying tea bills and they stop buying 10 year notes, believe me, the Fed is going to come under unbelievable stress extremely quickly. I haven't even spoken about the commercial banking system or the investment banking system, which will also take a hell of a knock. And if you go and have a look at the amount of products that you take for granted, including all of your Apple products, which are all assembled in China, a little bit of manufacturing in China, under present circumstances today, significant disruption of any of those global supply chains would have enormous implications. So the bottom line is we have created this highly integrated global economy and we're stuck with it. We've got to learn how to make it work. If we don't make it work, if we play better thy neighbor, in the middle of this particular game, we're all up to creep without a pattern. Sean, what do you think about the uh, Chinese efforts? Oh, hold on, hold on. Sorry. What, what do you think about the uh, current Chinese efforts to make the renminbi uh, global currency? They have every intention of making it a global currency, but they want to do it on their terms. And they can't do it on their terms as long as the Bretton Woods institutions essentially define the economic order. So part of what they're seeking to do at the moment by the, the diversion of their foreign exchange surpluses into new development institutions and currency exchange arrangements among developing countries is to create a counterweight to the global economic order that was created after 1945. When they're at the point, if they get to that particular point where that is in place, there's no question that it will become global tax. At some point in time, depending on what measures you use, at some point in time between 2018 and 2028, China will become the largest economy unless it explodes prior to that. At that point in time, it still cannot supplant the United States in any shape or form, not even in global terms. I mean, its per capita income will still be a tenth, roughly of what the United States is at that point in time. So in terms of welfare, it would be nowhere near the same level. But it can't even supplant it on a global level, but it becomes a fair competitor on a global level. So the nature of the negotiating framework will change significantly after that. Right. I don't want to do too much on this, because I deliberately, against the expectation that we would run over seriously, I've given you all of the meat Ready. But this is the inequality issue that you've got to worry about. Because this is the structural question. This happens to come from a rather good paper that Adair Turner did, who used to run the Financial Services Authority of the UK, that he did last year. But the bottom line is that we are seeing rising inequality and rising ratios of wealth to income as a consequence of two facts. Increasing leverage in investment, higher reliance on cheap money in terms of the investments themselves, lower equity components, and rising levels of debt, and that is driven by falling interest rates. So if you've got access to cheap money, and high leverage is an appropriate means of making investments, then it goes without saying 
it's then fairly obvious that you're going to see an increase in wealth to income, because most of your income and the leverage is being invested, and automatically you will see rising inequality under those circumstances. That's why I'm calling the structure. It's baked into the system under present circumstances. And it's one of your best arguments, John, I would say, under these circumstances, because if you haven't got access to the banking system, you're not anywhere near in play in respect to these opportunities. The problem about it is that hugely large numbers, and in some cases you might argue increasing numbers, of the world's population are outside of that game. And that game is baked in. Now, when you push that forward, you've got to recognize what the consequences are. This is much better than picketing, significantly better than most of the stuff that Stiglitz has done. It's a study done by two medical epidemiologists, which I hope is not going to bring on your birthday, but it's an answer to your question, did I understand statistics, which I chose not to answer at the time. But this is a study that was done by two medical epidemiologists who tracked 18 measures of social pathology or social health. So issues like Physical health, mental health, educational performance, child well-being, trust in community life, social mobility, teenage births, obesity, drug abuse, violence, and imprisonment. And they tracked that against data showing levels of income and wealth disparity in society. I have never seen such tight fits in respect of regression analysis in any set of data that I've looked at over 40 years. They are as tight as a drum. The simple reality is that society is characterized by high levels of income and wealth inequality have high incidences of social pathology. Full stop. No exceptions to the rule. I haven't got all the slides built in here, but the underlying thing is that having done it across all of the countries in the world who report this data through United Nations institutions, they then ran it in respect to the 50 states in the United States, measured by the same criteria. The fit isn't as close because of federal transfers, which don't exist on the global level, but the fit is still embarrassingly high. So the bottom line is that increasing inequality produces increasing social pathology, and increasing social pathology necessarily brings about a decline in the effectiveness of political systems and higher degrees of social unrest, which automatically cause you to rely then further on policing, the court systems and imprisonment, which once again create a vicious circle, which reinforces the trend. <coughs> it's not where you want to get stuck. We've got to get out of it as quickly as we possibly can. And I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but the underlying reality is that the new technologies that we are seeing are reinforcing this trend. And just to give you a sense of the whole, if we push it out, everything from electric cars to <coughs> reconfiguration of cities puts us in a position where we face the risk that the fastest rates of urbanization that are occurring in the world, which are not in the advanced economies, self-evidently, because the advanced economies are all highly urbanized already, will in fact create slums. That of the roughly two-thirds of 9.5 billion people who will be living in cities in 2050, you recognize that something like 6.2 million. As roughly 60% of those will be in countries that are today poor, the risk is that we're going to end up with that on a large scale. And that is not a world that in highly integrated economic and social terms we can afford to manage. Now, as I said, these disruptive technologies are reinforcing the strength. And the difficulty is we haven't got a clue what's going to come out of the pipeline. 
This is World Economic Forum's assessment the Global Agenda Council on Emerging Technologies, top emerging technologies for 2014. Those are the articles published over a period of three months by Brookings on robotics. And this is the outcome of the Canada Futures Survey, looking at new technologies in seven categories up to 2030. Don't even try to read them. I just want to give you a feel. This is what's coming through the pipeline. That's energy. That's agricultural and natural resources. That's digital and communications technologies. That's nanotechnology and material science. That's health technologies. That's neurotechnology and cognitive technologies. We don't know how these things are going to combine. We haven't got the faintest idea what technologies will come to market. Jim has recently done a very impressive article arguing essentially that innovation is not where the money is. Entrepreneurship is. Because innovation creates the wherewithal, but entrepreneurship translates it into economic opportunity. The point about it, there's no shortage of innovation coming through the pipeline. We have no idea who's going to pick up what and drive it in what direction under present circumstances. Now think about it if you happen to be in education in the present circumstances. Or think about it if you happen to be a parent or a grandparent. And you're saying, well, I'd like my children to have opportunity going forward. We have never seen as rich a research and development environment in human history as we are living with today. The level of congruence between these technologies is deeper, denser, and more remarkable than it has ever been in human history. The opportunities for disruption are phenomenal. But there's no way to plan for it educationally because we don't know what's going to come up. And then there's the policy issues related to all of this. Because you see, the underlying reality is that technology governance is actually social policy. Deciding what you're going to encourage, what you're going to discourage, what you're going to prohibit, what you're going to incentivize, it's all a function of the way you think about the world today and the way you think the world should look going forward. But every time there are new technologies, this transforms the way we think. If anyone had postulated 15 years ago that there would be a generation of people under the age of 25 who, rather than engaging with other human beings, or getting out and doing things, would in fact prefer to sit staring at screens of various sizes, interacting with other people digitally. If anyone had stood up 15 years ago and said, this is the way the world is going to emerge, it would have been laughed off the stage. It is contrary to everything we know about human biology, almost everything we know about human psychology. And yet it's the current reality. So, we need humility as we're grappling with this particular challenge. The only thing that's certain is that it is going to be hugely disruptive in respect of employment, hugely disruptive in respect of education, and enormously in power in respect of opportunities for entrepreneurship. Geopolitics, I'm not going to talk about. Bottom line is we've got big problems across very large spaces. And as a consequence of all of those things, we are seeing shifts that we probably can't manage simultaneously. That's Gallup, which you can probably see there. Gallup showed the rise in Putin's popularity as a consequence of taking Crimea. These are the July 18 figures from the Gallup report. Look at that surge from 2013 to 2014, and look at the surge in their estimation about the quality of Russian institutions over the same period. This is not based on analytical insight. This is based on a sense that we're back on the world stage. We're good. We stuck it to those whatever. Westerners, Ukrainians, Americans, whoever. But that's the problem. Because that's how people react and the conditions of space. Most people Karim was saying to me earlier that people in the Maghreb 
and in the Levant tend to be emotional. I forbore to say to him that under stress, everybody's emotional. There's Russians being emotional. What happened, Sean, when the That is the answer. The bottom line is they're probably going to have negative growth this year. They certainly will have negative growth next year. And in the short term, he will play this off by blaming it on the West. That's not sustainable. So therefore, we either solve this problem fast, or he becomes utterly unpredictable in terms of the game back there. This guy is a very interesting human being. I've met him three times, and I have a fair sense of him. He's a very, very interesting human being. He is a technology phone. He doesn't use any form of modern technology. He doesn't even use a digital phone. He uses an analog phone in his office and doesn't use a phone outside. Security reasons, I guess. Security. Well, he doesn't wear a shirt. What's the reason that? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that could be simply biological. <laughs> he was going through a rough period in his marriage and he has moved on. I don't know if he's related to that or not. Um, but, but that's the first thing about him. The second thing is that he's remarkably puritanical in a whole variety of different ways. And the third thing is that he's a controller. Uh, anyone who saw him crack down on Pussy Riot, which by definition posed no threat whatever to the security of the Russian state, must have known what he was going to do in the context of Crimea. So there wasn't any real difficulty uh, in understanding. I mean, he, he did a rather remarkable speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2008. He did a subsequent uh, op-ed in the New York Times in, on September 13, 2013. And he did a major speech at Sochi uh, about six weeks ago now. All of which had exactly the same message in terms of the whole. Russia has three fundamental non-negotiable requirements. Strategic nuclear parity with the United States. Recognition is a great power whose view has to be taken seriously on all major issues deemed to be of national importance to Russia and geopolitical control of the other world. No, it's not. It's the Monroe Doctrine, by the way. It's, it's, it's exactly the third one. It's exactly the Monroe Doctrine. It it's familiar. not here. No, the thing is, uh, with all due respect, I think uh, Russia has been a little bit provoked on, on, its, name, on, on, on its borders. I mean, yeah, exactly. yeah, they have been provoked. Imagine if Russians were doing again missiles in Cuba. The US would react uh, the same way. So, I know, I know. One, one of the dumbest things, and those of us who wrote about it at the time were sort of having a field day in terms of saying we told you so at the moment, so it's not very really important, but one of the dumbest things was in the aftermath of the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and the implosion of the Soviet Union in 1991, not to take the point, how do we reconfigure the security architecture of Europe from the Atlantic to the Europe. There was an opportunity to do that at that point in time. Nam Lugar was the first step in respect of doing that in terms of mopping up loose nukes and everything associated with that, but it wasn't followed through. And because it wasn't followed through, because NATO expansion then went from 16 to 28 and pushed up very close to Russian borders, if you understand Putin's psychology, his response is predictable. The difficulty about it is that we've now got to crawl back from that particular point and try and figure out how we're going to deal with this particular crisis because they are the second largest nuclear power in the world and he is unfortunately somebody who has made it absolutely clear that there are lines you can't cross. So figuring out how to deal with it is a larger challenge. Merkel is taking the lead in respect of this. Merkel made proposals to him in the G20 in Melbourne. And there are two back channel negotiations underway at the moment to try to get this off the ground, but it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Because you can't be seen to be rewarding land grabs on the one side, and you can't play mines bigger than yours uh, on the other side. Does that know, uh, in fact, you answer 80% of my, of my question, but imagine the United States if the southern border was Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if uh, Russia was deploying missiles at the border, which is uh, yeah. the point, and which in addition, uh, Europe expands NATO right at its border. Now, without me putting, everybody would take it by extremely aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, what, bottom line is, you, know, you can only see the world from where you stand. It, uh, and, and, and that's, 
it's worthwhile remembering that in this highly connected world. If you live in Moscow, you see the world from Moscow. If you live in Washington, you see the world from Washington. If you live in Berlin, and you tend to sort of see the world from a number of different places at the same time. <laughs> Everybody know we're going to get, we, we will end on time. Don't worry, we're, we're, we're working the schedule. I hope you're enjoying this. Yes, yes. Not to worry, we always have more content, we have time. This is an active dimension, we will end on time. All right, I'm not going to go through details. <coughs> Bottom line is, democracy isn't working the way it used to. And it's not working because of these underlying economic tensions associated with the inability to be able to square the circle in respect of national aspirations across all demographics. If you've got rising inequality, then the system doesn't seem to be working. If you have parties that are more closely associated with a particular segment of a social economic demographic than the whole of the segment, then you tend to get increasing political polarization. And that's what we're seeing across all of the demographic paradigms, if you like, at this point in time. And one of the consequences of all of that is that the youth are shifting increasingly away from politics to social media. So the fundamental mechanism for political expression today, I, the study is referenced over here, so you can take a look at the original study, done by Telefonica together with the Economist Intelligence Unit, but it shows that the great majority of young millennials, as we call them, do not today regard the political system of their own country as reflecting their values and interests, or as an appropriate means of ensuring that they are able to exercise an influence. So we're not likely to see a significant improvement democratic participation any time in the future. Ironically, the only parts of the world where you have majorities who actually believe in democratic systems are in Asia and the Middle East and Africa. And that's chiefly because they don't have all that much of it. As a result of that, we're seeing crowds in the street. It's not just Fahir Square and Taksim, it's everywhere. It's Bangkok, it's Rio, it's Kiev, it's Hong Kong, and more. I've left out London and Paris. I haven't gone to the remarkable sort of, I don't mean Paris in the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo, I mean Paris in the period immediately before that in respect of frustrations among agricultural communities. And the point is, we can't solve for these problems because the creation of democratic polities takes a long time. They don't fall out of the sky. They're very difficult to create. The last challenge is all of this is playing out in an environment where humans are stressing the atmosphere and stressing the biogeosphere for the first time. The reason we call this era the Anthropocene is just because humans are having more impact on the biogeosphere now than they ever had before. We seem to have managed to overcome most of the constraints that the biogeosphere imposes on us as a species. Our technological capacity, the UAE being probably the most outstanding example, our technological capacity allows us to transform environments in completely improbable ways. But that comes in a price. And the price, to summarize again, is 7.2 billion on the way to 9.5, 55% urbanized shifting to 67% urbanized, with much higher levels of consumption, production, and waste. And that inevitably, in a finite environment, produces some stresses. So, thinking about how we're going to deal with this goes far beyond climate. What we get out of the Paris talks in March of 2015 in respect to climate is unclear. It's probably not going to be adequate. But it's not just climate. Technologically, we can solve all of these problems. That thing on the left, I don't know if Philip has ever been there, but that actually happens to be in Snowmass in Colorado 
where Avery Lovins, without any external form of energy, grows bananas in the snow in snowmen's. I'm above the ski Now, so the technology is not actually the constraint under present circumstances. And that trend is likely to continue because as a result of what China is doing with scaling renewable technologies, prices are being driven to the floor. The price of solar PV has come down four times in the course of the past two years. And that trend is likely to continue. <coughs> China is building the largest wind farm on the planet. When that farm is in existence, it will be larger than the total installed capacity in Europe. One point. That's the difficulty about the Chinese. They do tend to do things at scale. All sorts of new technologies are emerging in these particular areas. Everything from recycled plastic printed housing in terms of 3D printing, it's now actually happening in China, to artificial silk leaf photosynthesis capabilities, and these are in development. Flying cars are actually already in prototype. I have witnessed flying car uh, test runs. There's often an opportunity to fly one of the side of the most models ready for it. And that thing on the left has actually already preliminary funding in Dubai. The preliminary funding has already been committed for it. So now there's a place where you can land the flying cars in addition. So the only thing that I would say to you is don't limit your thinking around these issues to electric cars and driverless cars and limited things like that operation in two dimensional spaces. It's entirely possible that Flash Gordon technology will be with us faster than we think. Now, the bottom line, I'm not going to go through all of this, you can look at it, but the bottom line is, unfortunately, all the stuff I've talked about works in the system. And if I were live with this particular software at the moment, I would show you the degrees of freedom in the interactions in this particular system. It's absolutely extraordinary. If you map it in two-dimensional formats, don't worry about what's up there, they're just what we've talked about but they show the systemic relationships between them. And in particular, that oval at the bottom is the particular relationship between the increasing returns to capital and falling returns to labor. As a consequence, jobless growth because of the disaggregation between productivity and job creation, and the trend going forward that the disruptive new technologies will increase those returns. Now what that produces is a series of drivers of change in a system where disruptive new congruent technologies and the revival of geopolitics will exacerbate jobless growth, migratory flows, the weakening of representative democracy, and increasing returns to capital and falling returns to labor. If you change the relationships a little, and I've changed them just in those three areas marked in red, then what happens is the disruptive new technologies associated with changes in the biogeosphere then depend, in terms of their outcomes, on what happens in the geopolitical sphere. And your outcomes then are weakening of representative democracy, jobless growth, migratory flows, and increasing returns to capital and falling returns to labor. Now the important thing to understand about this is we have to solve for it. There is nothing in the moment, nothing, that suggests that these trends are not occurring. It doesn't matter whether China has a hard landing. It doesn't matter whether the geoeconomic shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific continues in its present day. It is agnostic in respect to those particular phenomena. It's baked into this system. We're a highly connected economy with a very large population, increasing consumption, is operating in confined geophysical spaces with increasing returns to capital and declining returns to land. It's baked into the system. So if we can't solve for those, the outcomes are pretty good. We have to solve for those. And that's why I think we're all here today. Because dealing with the issue of inequality, ensuring inclusivity, enabling access, is the only way to get political systems back into the role that they are supposed to play, which is enabling a balance of interests.
in every national society and then hopefully across national borders to enable coexistence on the global scale. Thanks very much. It's been unbelievable.